So perhaps I can invite Ching Xiong to put forward his um, arguments on why we should stick to oral regimens. Ching Xiong. Thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to start by saying that last night as I was going back to my hotel room, I got into the lift and two gentlemen got into the lift after me and they thought they, I couldn't hear them, but uh, they were obviously your friends, Laura, because they were mentioning who's the poor sort who's going to have the floor wiped with uh, Laura's, oppo <laughs> Laura's opponent. It is I. Uh, so I'm here to actually talk about why, you know, why embark on long-acting regimens when oral therapies are working very well. Um, and I would just like to start in, as all debate start by setting a few ground rules and definitions for what we'll be talking about. I think, firstly, when we talk about long-acting antiretrovirals, we are really referring to those that have the potential for introduction today, right, uh, to a fairly general population of people living with HIV. In short, we're talking about intramuscular long-acting cabotagravir and rilpivirine, which have been approved by a number of different sort of um, uh, authorities and bodies already, as opposed to, for example, lenacapavir, where its use is still limited to a fairly you know, small clinical indication. I'm going to be making the argument that we are not yet ready for wide community level rollout. We are not say, I'm not saying that these medications have no use whatsoever and that they should never be introduced. I'm just saying not now. And in the spirit of the debate, I think when we talk about the time for long-acting uh, injectables, we should be talking and arguing over an implementation strategy that is wide community level. In short, what we're going to say today is, or what Laura's going to try to convince you of today, is that the time... Uh, prime time for long-acting cabotagravir and rilpivirine is today, but what I will show you over the next 10 or so minutes is that the prime time hasn't quite come yet. And this is because of a few different um, um, uh, scenarios, right? I will be showing you a number of slides over the course of my speech today that will look very similar to these. So when I did my literature review for this debate, I found lots of review papers, lots of opinion papers, lots of editorials talking about why long-acting uh, injectables were the future of antiretroviral therapy, and every last one of them had a table that looked like this. On one section, you'd have advantages. On another, you'd have disadvantages. And almost always, the section on disadvantages was longer, chunkier, wordier, and much more eloquently phrased. I'm not going to go through all of them with you uh, like uh, Daryl did. I'm putting this up there for its visual effect. Remember what this table looks like, because many other tables that look just like this are coming up. And when you have something that has so many disadvantages, so many challenges, I think it very clearly points out that prime time hasn't quite arrived yet. So the first reason why I think prime time for long-acting cabotagravir and rilpivirine is not quite here yet is because in almost all of the studies, all of the trials evaluating long-acting intramuscular uh, cabotagravir and rilpivirine, what has been established beyond a shadow of a doubt is non-inferiority, which is fine, I suppose. But efficacy is also dependent on, you know, baseline NNRTI resistance that these patients have, specifically affecting, you know, rilpivirine, which is a one half of this regimen. And this is not a small problem. It can be fairly a uh, significant issue in much of the world where um, ARV access needs to be improved and where you would be thinking about long-acting cabotagravir and rilpivirine in the first place. Now, in these settings, getting baseline or routine uh, genetic uh, uh, GRT testing or resistance testing is really not that widely available. And then, of course, there's the whole concept of needing to consider whether there are certain viral subtypes, like the A1 and A6 subtypes, uh, whether we need to look for sort of a baseline uh, resistance patterns, especially with L74i. The jury is still out regarding this, um, but I think where you still have to think about these, it makes implementation on a wider level a little bit more complicated table, I just uh, want to draw your attention to the red box showing uh, you know, that I uh, did not pull the non-inferiority um, assertion out of, out of a hat. All of the trials, the important trials evaluating this have demonstrated non-inferiority, not superiority, which, I, like I said, is fine, but is it enough for prime time? Now, in terms of safety, right, I put it to you that less than 30% of uh, participants in capital recovery trials so far have been non-white. 27.5% of participants have been women, not in pregnant women, not in children. I mean, for ART trials, it's nothing really new, but unfortunately still happens and should uh, come into our decision making when it comes to introducing things that are so innovative, things that are first in class, and things that are moving from oral tablets to something much more invasive. 
what happens with misdosis, what happens with uh, providing oral bridging. Now, all of these are considerations which I think, while they have been thought about, have not really been um, uh, elaborated fully in all of the guidelines that are recommending cabotegravir and rilpivirine. And I think because of that, you know, and, and the niggling thoughts that we have around its safety, especially in situations where its implementation may not be perfect, uh, we, we do need to take pause and say that prime time is not yet here. Um, I recently uh, spoke with uh, Professor Anton Posniak, and he sort of uh, shared with us that uh, based on the data that's already out there, uh, patients taking intramuscular cabotegravir and rapivirine do sort of have a risk, an ongoing risk of virologic failure and resistance. At year one, about one in 70 fail. At year two, about one in 60. And this failure occurs even in spite of one of on-time injections. Um, is this risk of failure really acceptable, even when balanced against uh, the, the fact that it offers perhaps a little bit more privacy, a bit more confidentiality, a bit more um, of the, you know, not having to take oral medications every day. Is it uh, worth uh, this risk of actually losing an integrase inhibitor and a new, uh, an NRTI if resistance occurs with failure? All of these tables are taken from different studies and different papers show that uh, long-acting uh, capitagravir and pipirine fail with mutations, which may have long-lasting ramifications uh, for future antiretroviral choice. One of the much vaunted uh, uh, benefits of long-acting uh, ART is that it helps perhaps improve adherence. Uh, studies that we published show that barriers to ART resistance do include things like pill fatigue, uh, trouble swallowing pills, the fact that daily medications may remind people living with HIV of their conditions. And in these situations, I think long acting does work, right? You cut down treatment days from 365 a year to just six days a year with a two monthly uh, a dosing interval. But also, I think we cannot put our heads in the sand and, and imagine that these are the only factors affecting pill adherence. There's also stigma. There's also poor health literacy, there's mental health and substance use disorders, things that my previous esteemed speakers talked about, competing priorities. None of these will be solved by rushing into the wide-scale uh, implementation of long-acting capitagravir and ropivirine, and may in fact distract from them or push resources away from addressing these problems. I show you the table there just to remind you of what it looks like. These are barriers to uptake of long-acting injectables. Uh, but the point I'm making here is that the implementation of long-acting injectables is likely to take away resources from other much more needed aspects of HIV care. The fact that we need an oral lead-in that then transitions up, which may not be uh, needed uh, um, anymore. The need for a cold chain for the real pivoting component of this regimen. The manpower cost of implementation, training, education, teaching people how to look out for uh, injection site reactions, outreach, educating people about the needs and the specific uh, uh, features of long-acting intramuscular injections. All of these will take time, will take resources, and especially at a time when our global and national health systems are only just starting to, be, uh, to recover from the pandemic, I think this is not a wise use of uh, uh, limited healthcare resources. How do we identify uh, candidates for injectable ART, provide counselling, uh, or a lead in a uh, schedule and counsel for initial injections? Not, these are not things that can be done easily, especially in settings that are a little bit more resource limited. And I think until we know how we can do this uh, for every setting in which long-acting injectables are, um, you know, we want to implement them, uh, I don't think it's ready for prime time yet on a logistical uh, point of view. Uh, the last paper that I pulled out was actually a review paper authored by Laura Waters, <laughs> which actually listed and enumerated, uh, it very helpfully helped me summarize some of the problems that come with uh, it, the clinical implementation of long-acting antiretroviral uh, treatment, including considerations of viral failure and resistance, which I talked to you about, all of the practical considerations I've already listed, and cost effectiveness. Modeling studies have shown that it's long-acting injectables are only cost-effective in those who have had previous failures and resistance. And this is not an indication for which long-acting capitagravirin and is currently approved, and also for those with a high adherence to visits. And of course, there's no pregnancy data. So hopefully, Professor Walters will address these points in her speech later on. I show you again the last uh, uh, slide that shows all of the problems, the gaps and challenges in implementing long-acting cabotegravir and ropivirine. And I put it to you that um, 
the, the, the last thing that we need to talk about is the philosophical questions. Do we know what problem we're trying to solve with a jab every two months? Is it stigma? Is it uh, uh, that's related to HIV? Is it internalized stigma? Is it other levels of stigma? Uh, we have to remember that the example of long-acting treatment that we have currently that we most know, long-acting antipsychotics, it's noted in the literature that it used to be pushed on people of certain you know, ethnicities more than others because their doctors believed that they would be less adherent to oral medications. Uh, this is the experience in the United States. Uh, and I think when we are thinking about something that's new, when we're thinking about something that's invasive, uh, unless these problems around sort of justice and fairness are addressed, uh, it's not fair for it to be prime time yet. It's expensive. Uh, there's a risk for iniqui uh, iniquity and inequality in terms of access. Um, so I think all of these are things we need to think about. Uh, once again, a list of challenges that's longer than the list of opportunities. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chen Xiong. I think, I think you've convinced a fair section of the room, but uh, let's, see if they, let's see if they change their, their minds after Laura um, takes to the podium. Oh, thank you. That was a really nice try. Um, <laughs> and you're very brave. Um, I think obviously I've got the advantage of going second, so I can point out a couple of things that uh, you always know someone's on a back foot when they change the question. All of this prime time stuff wasn't anything that I was asked to talk about. It's just that why should we embark on non acting injectables at all? And I love the bit about in non inferiority, it's fine, I suppose. Well, perhaps you should tell Gilead because Big Tarvi wouldn't be in existence, would it? Because it's never been superior to anything. Anyhow. Um, you laid down the gauntlet. Right, so here's my, I'm going to say tablets work. Of course they work, but injectables work. Choice matters, closing thought. So tablets work, and obviously, this is HIV over the last 40 years, and we've made incredible progress in so many ways. You all know that. That's why we're all here celebrating things, talking about statin treatment, when we wouldn't even think people would need statins 40 years ago because they wouldn't be alive. And all of that progress, of course, has been with tablets. We know that, and tablets work. But there are issues. You have to take them every day. All the tablets that you have to take, you have to take them every day. And you all sit here and think, oh, it's fine. You know, we've all got people who pitch up eight months after their appointment and didn't miss a dose, but they only got six months of meds. We all know people maintain viral suppression with lower rates of adherence. We've got drugs with good half-lives. But actually, we know that also there's evidence that suboptimal adherence in the absence of viral rebound drives inflammation. So actually, we need to take adherence seriously even if somebody's virally suppressed. Drug-drug interactions, what I call drug-life interactions, actually, because if someone wants to go and take some magnesium or some supplements to improve their health, that's not medication, that's life-enhancing stuff. And when our integrase inhibitors orally are great, they are associated with interactions with over-the-counter medications, and that's something I think is really important. And let's not forget, for people living with HIV, taking a pill every day is a daily reminder. And I think thinking of this as a micro-stigma is a really important thing. Because if you have to keep your pills private when you have no privacy, as so many people do, that's a really important consideration. Now, injectables do work. Do they work for treatment? Yes, they do. So they're non-inferior as you kindly pointed out, in suppressed individuals. But, and you've already said the six versus 365 days a year point. And people in trials strongly prefer them. This isn't just like, oh, well, 52% preferred injectables. It's not. It's this majority of people prefer injectable treatment. And you rightly again pointed out, we don't have data in people who have uh, detectable viremia, but there is emerging data. And that data from the San Francisco clinic presented at Croy showed this is life-saving for people who don't have any other options. These are people who would not have suppressed in any other way. And who are we to say that that's not an important priority? Yes, viral rebound and resistance, and there is indeed the data from Atlas 2M. It's nice that you quoted uh, Anton Posniak because he probably lifted those figures direct from the Beaver Guidelines, uh, first author Waters. Um, but they're right. <laughs> By year three, and I've been I've been talking about these figures an awful lot. 
but there are always teething problems at the beginning. We, we have to learn. And actually, the multifactorial analysis, which showed that NNRTR resistance, subtype A6A1, BMI less than 30, I've put in brackets, because on its own, I don't think it's important at all. If you've got none of those factors, actually, your estimated risk of virologic failure is just 1 in 250 per year. And that's important, because if we look at SOLAR, our most recent study, and this is the first study comparing two monthly injectables with oral. We've had monthly versus two monthly. We've had one monthly versus oral, but we hadn't had two monthly versus oral. And what was the rebound rate in solar? One in 250 at year one, because we're learning. We're learning from these important analyses, and we're learning who is at lowest risk of viral rebound. And how important is this? I mean, you know, I stand up at conferences and of course I'm concerned about viral rebound and resistance, but this is about autonomy. Ultimately, my job is to know the data and inform the person in front of me. My job isn't to decide whether that person should then have injectables or not, because that very small risk of rebound and resistance is the person with HIV's risk to take, not mine. I'm there to inform, I am not there to decide. Now, what about injectables for prevention? Yes, hell yes, it works. And let's, this is, this is game changing. And the trials, we've got superiority. We've got non-inferiority. If that's not good enough, let's look at prevention. We've got superiority. And for women particularly, where we have had no effective PrEP option in clinical trials, it's just, it would be unethical not to provide injectable prevention. And there's the data from HPTN 083 showing that very, very Point. We must offer options to everybody, and women have been particularly underserved by our prevention efforts. So how important is this? It's hugely important. I as go as far to say this is a human right. We've got an option that's superior to our current options to prevent HIV in women at risk, and it would be a denial of human rights to deny them injectables. And choice is so important. I show this slide so often. This is about contraception. But the point is, it's about choice. This is a WHO review showing the more options are available, the more use there is. So there are more women on contraception, the more options we have. And I think it's quite reasonable to apply the same assumption to HIV prevention. And that ties in nicely. If we think about, again, women who've been so underserved, with things like three-monthly contraception and evidence suggesting that for women, IMCAB could possibly be dosed every three months. We're aligning needs. We're aligning HIV prevention with contraceptive needs. And just some closing thoughts. I think this is just the first step. We have focused on cabotegravir and rilpivirine, of course, because that is what's available now. But there are many other options in the pipeline, as you all know. And we're dealing with an ageing population. People are going to have to take more and more tablets. So again, who are we to deny now a tablet sparing option that's highly effective for HIV treatment? And especially considering from next week, everyone's going to be taking a statin as well. And I think when we think about things like statins and long-term conditions and comorbidities, this is about an equity issue. Across all other long-term conditions, there is a shift towards long-acting treatments. Why should people with HIV be underserved? That would be in Equitable. So I shall finish there. Thank you for your kind attention. So before we come to um, judging who won this debate, I'm going to allow a few questions from the floor. So we'll see um, if there are anyone in the audience who need more convincing from either of the debaters. Please. Hello, I'm Mildred Obari. I'm a medical doctor from Kenya. And mine will be for Laura to convince me because I feel like Dr. Wong will uh, had such a low lying fruit, sub African, <laughs> sub Saharan Africa, in terms of health inequity. Looking at the HIV burden, it's so high in sub Saharan Africa. In term, and that is where I feel like these long acting injectables would probably benefit uh, the masses. And looking at even the scalability in terms of ARVs, the oral pills, it's already so low. Like in terms of it's there, but now the availability. I was working in a rural facility where people could go some like three months because of maybe border issues, uh, getting the aid in, in and also 
a lot of political issues getting just the ARVs to the ground. So looking at such kind of a place where already the oral pills are not as readily available as we would want them to be. So considering the cost of the long acting inje injectables, how scalable is it in a place like Sub-Saharan Africa? So, because I, I feel like it might lead to what Dr. Wong was saying, eventually it might lead to uh, resistance and such kind of things. Second thing, I think um, advancing in terms of uh, treatment, uh, now looking at uh, things like um, long acting injectables, I feel like it's what is making big organization think and start advocating for treatment for prevention instead of going into some, some aspects like vaccines or primary prevention. So how are we going to change their perspective about uh, incorporating or rather integrating all this to be both treatment for prevention, primary prevention, and even bringing in the vaccines? Thank you. Um, I mean, Obviously, hugely important points, and, and you know, what can I say sitting here in my position of privilege prescribing United Kingdom where things are obviously very different. But I think when innovation occurs, that's, that's the lever and that's the inspiration to try and drive change. You're very lucky that half his audience is from Vive Healthcare. So speak to them about implementation programs, speak to them about how to deliver this, because we can, and you're absolutely right. Of course, there are places where it's been really challenging rolling out oral therapy, but we heard today in, in the talk about reaching elimination, achieving elimination, how many countries in Africa are, are, are kicking Europe's ass when it comes to, to viral suppression and antiretroviral rollout. So it shows it can be done and it can be done in, in very resource, resource limited settings. And this is, I think the key thing is, you know, I, I'm, I'm not arguing that injectables are right for everybody. What I'm arguing is injection, injectables are an option for people. But I think particularly for prevention, you talked about what a high incidence there is. And a lot of that will be due to the fact that there just hasn't been an effective option for women for PrEP. So even if we forget the treatment argument for now, I think for prevention, this is a a huge priority because if we can really make a dent for incidents, particularly for women, which we haven't been able to before, then that's going to shift resources, enable us to focus on offering a wider variety of treatment options. Tristan. Is that working? It is. Thank you. Thanks, Adiba. Laura. Oh, your voice is coming out of there. Uh, <laughs> Laura, thank you both very much. That was very entertaining, very informative. Uh, Tristan Barber from London. Laura, sorry to put you on the spot again, but you have been fantastic at communicating what you thought was the risk of uh, resistance in failure on injectable agents. You've got a very memorable cartoon that has penetrated the, the consciousness, I think, of everyone about that interpretation. And I wondered if you'd change your opinion on that and how you counsel people you're putting onto injectables about the risk of failure and resistance. Thank you. No, absolutely. So, of course, I counsel people at the risk of, of virologic failure and, and resistance. And, I, and I do stand by the fact that with our current long-acting option, it is, it is a limitation to, to, in a context of 100% adherence to CVAR or rebound. But what I say now is, if that person, and I've got the luxury of being able to do the tests, if they're non-A subtype, if they don't have resistance, and actually, to be honest, if it's BMI alone, based on the multifactorial analysis and what that concern, I will now say to them, actually, the latest data is that you've got a one in 250 chance. And then it's down to them. Because if they're living with another partner or their sexual partners are also living with HIV or their sexual partners have other partners and they're on PrEP, then actually that very, very small risk of rebound isn't an issue. I've got other people for whom viral rebound, they just can't even entertain that small thought so they don't have injectables so it has and, and I just we talk about the options and I've had uh, to quote somebody that small risk of viral rebound is not as important as not having to be reminded of living with HIV every day and I think the other thing and I mentioned sort of multi pills for other conditions one thing I hear a lot is well, if someone's taking eight pills a day already taking an HIV pill doesn't make a difference it does because that HIV pill is in a bottle with an HIV medication name on it and again it's you know I actually contrary to what you know <laughs> some of the things that I've written and how they've been interpreted, I actually give very, very balanced discussions and I discuss injectables at, at every visit. 
genuinely. All right, I don't know if this is an indication that the audience need more convincing for you. So I hope the third question is going to be directed at Chen Xiong to, to affirm his argument. So go ahead. Unfortunately not, but... Um... <laughs> Um, I'll just try, but um, I'm Ernest from Sydney. I have just a question about care ballet as prep. Um, my concern is the Levi syndrome that's associated with care ballet. In, um, although it's rare with viral breakthrough on care ballet, uh, the fact that when it happens, universal accumulation mutations to INSTI happens, and it affects the use of integrase inhibitors as first-line treatment then. Um, until we have proper techniques to identify Levi syndrome and reduce the delay to detection of viral breakthrough, I feel that care ballet, widespread care ballet rollout may be limited. And that's understandable, and that's a, a, a very, dare I say, pure position to take. That's that's you know if if you're being impeccable and, and don't want to see integrated resistance. But I would refer you to the WHO guidelines and the work undertaken by Andrew Phillips and his team. And that modeling shows that yes, the number of people with integrated resistance may increase with widespread rollout of PrEP, but the number of people with newly acquired HIV will be much, much lower. And if that's not enough, mortality will be less. So we're really saying a bit more integrase resistance is more important than less mortality. I, I think not. So that would be my pushback on that one. Thank you. So, okay, before we move on to our final speaker, we do want to see who managed to convince um, the audience more. Um, and I don't have a, a slide or a card to, to look at this, but um, just a basic clap will do. <laughs> Those in favor of sticking to oral treatment for now. <laughs> and those who think we're ready for long acting prime time. I'm actually deaf in oh, one stop, year. Stop <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually deaf in one year, so I thought that was a, that was a draw, right? <laughs> yeah, okay, so we, we're gonna need, so thank you very much, Sheng Xiong and uh, Laura, and 